Uh, so welcome to this Medicine for Members event. Can I have a kidney transplant at the Royal Free? The answer is yes, so you can all go now. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, seriously, um, uh, this event is organised by the governors of the, the hospital, so before we start talking about the subject tonight, uh, can I just introduce you to some of the governors that have joined us this evening? So would governors like to stand up and I'll, in, I'll introduce all of you. We've got Derek over here and Richard, who are newly elected uh, governors, and Richard Lindley and Judy De Winter, who uh, Richard is a re-elected governor, Judy is an existing governor, uh, and I'm David Myers, and I'm a re-elected governor. Uh, some of you may know, some of you may not, so I'll just bore you with something about uh, what governors do and what our responsibilities are. We do quite a lot of work, but our two key areas that we're responsible for, number one, to be a, we need to uh, uh, keep to account the non-executive directors for the role that they play in uh, the, uh, in the management of the Royal Free Hospital. And the second thing that we do, whether we're a, a patient governor or a public governor, is look after your interests. Uh, and we do that by listening to the concerns that you may have. And uh, if there are specific concerns, we'll direct you to where you can get your answers. And the other thing is that we obviously want to listen to what patients have got to say, the good and the bad, and be able to relay that to the appropriate parts of, of the organisation. So if there are any of you here that actually do have some concerns, then pick out one of the governors that I've introduced you to when we've finished and when you have a cup of tea and you can always take some of those concerns to, to my colleagues and we'll see if we can direct you into the, the right area. So uh, the reason why I been asked to chair this particular event is that one of my other roles is that I am the president of the Royal Free Kidney Patients Association uh, and I'm also uh, a renal patient. I uh, experienced dialysis treatment for nine years and I also had a transplant 16 years ago. And when I think about um, the, the kind of treatment that our renal patients get. We've, renal patients are very lucky because the fact that we have so many patients under the Royal Free Banner, uh, we've got probably something like a, a thousand patients having dialysis, a combination of hemodialysis, that's the dialysis on the machines, or peritoneal dialysis, which is dialysis which is done on a regular basis through the stomach. So there's about a thousand patients there. We've, we're probably now transplanting two to three patients a week. So that's between 100 and 150 transplants during the year. And we've got uh, a large contingent of what we call low clearance patients. So those are patients that uh, have, the begin have what we call chronic kidney disease, might be uh, on the, in the process to require uh, renal replacement therapy at some stage in the future. It would be right about 1,000 patients there. So it's about 4,000 patients. Because we've got so many patients, we've actually got a really big and an impressive renal team, uh, a, a very broad cross-section of experience in terms of our consultants, our surgeons, uh, specialist nurses, uh, and other um, associated services like psychology services. This is very different to what I experienced going back almost 25 years ago. My first experience of finding out that I had a problem, I had the beginnings of chronic kidney disease, was my GP rang me up, and this was a most unusual experience for, the, for my GP to call me directly and say, David, you've got to come into uh, to the surgery and see me and uh, so I went to, to, to see him one evening uh, and I remember quite clearly sitting in front of him he was at his desk he picked up a file 
and, he, uh, and then he thought for a minute and then he said to me, uh, I'm afraid you're in serious trouble, you're going to die. Then he put the, the document down and said, I'm sorry, that was the previous patient. <laughs> let's, let's concentrate on you now. Um, thank you very much, Richard. <laughs> And then he, um, and basically he told me I had very high blood pressure. And I really didn't understand the consequences of that. And that's sort of like the, uh, the kind of thing that would happen 25 years ago, that you wouldn't really know that you, the relevance of high blood pressure and the fact that my blood <coughs> results were showing that I had a, a problem with my kidneys. He sent me to see uh, a... Uh, private doctor at uh, UCH and this was a man who was supposedly uh, an expert renal clinician um, and the kind of appointment that I had with him uh, bearing in mind it's private and I suppose in today's money we're, we're probably talking about the equivalent of uh, a charge of 250 pounds which my private medical paid for uh, but we would sit in a 45 minute appointment the first 40 minutes would be taken up with talking about my social life restaurants I went to uh, the stock market um, my girlfriends and the last five minutes is oh, you know, we better talk about your blood results so you imagine that kind of thing happening today but that's what I experienced and then after seeing him for about three years one day he said to me, you are going, and this is, you know, this bit's not a joke, you are going to need to start dialysis in about a week or ten days time, otherwise you will drop dead. And you imagine a patient that knows, that still knows nothing about chronic kidney disease, knows I knew my kidneys uh, weren't working properly, I'm on all sorts of blood pressure tablets, but now I'm being told my whole life's going to change um, and I'm going to have to start dialysis. And when I asked this, this so-called expert uh, consultant, where, will I, where should I go? He told me, uh, well, I think they do dialysis at Central Middlesex. That's the only place I know. Uh, so that was the, the, the depth of his knowledge. And even six months later, after I had done all of the, my own research into where I should go. Six months afterwards, he rang me up to say, I've got a patient here that needs dialysis. Can you recommend where I should send them? And so this is the sad, this was the sad truth. Now, I'm telling you these, this kind of thing because it's completely different. The world, the world of renal and the kind of service that renal patients get today is com completely different. Uh, and the spread of expertise that's in this hospital uh, means that patients do get a fantastic service. Um, uh, and the subject we're talk going to be talking about is kidney transplantation. When I had my kidney transplant um, 60, almost 16 years ago, I was in this hospital for eight weeks before the transplant worked. I had what was called a lazy kidney. Uh, and there weren't the services at the time to be able to offer uh, support to me, so, um, psychological services of some sort. I basically was left to sort my own life out. I had to retire from my, a business that I ran and I spent six months getting my confidence back. Now we're lucky today that we have people like Faiza who has a specific interest in finding out uh, how patients react to having had a transplant and how much information her and her colleagues would need to know to be able to understand more about what transplant patients go through and the kind of services they need and the kind of support that they need to make their experience a better experience. So right now I'm going to hand over to Faiza Kazim to be able to explain to you and you'll understand a little bit about what I missed out when I had my transplant. Thank you. I should tell you, uh, the reason I've used this title is because 
one of the things I've done in the last couple of years here is to start doing some work on patient education. Um, and even the simplest things sometimes that are self-evident to us might not be evident to a patient, their family, or the public. So let's master the um, IT. But I'm going to start, like David, by sharing a little bit about myself, because one of the things I teach the medical students is that actually everyone who comes in to see us is a person first. And we want to know the person before we can think about the patient. And I've known David now for um, since I came here in, in May um, 2013. And my story is that my grandparents were from Pakistan. I was born in Kenya. I grew up in Yorkshire. So there are two pictures of Yorkshire there. One is Haworth, the, the, the usual uh, hilly um, uh, cobbled street where many of you might have been to visit the place where the Brontes lived. And the other more sunny picture up at the top left is the painting by David Hockney, which shows God's own country in full sunlight, which does frequently happen. So my strongest features are those for Yorkshire women, and so I speak very directly. But they were modified a bit by being educated in Cambridge. I was at Newnham College, and then I trained all the way around the country. And that was fantastic, because I've visited all the great cities. I've worked with some fantastic people, with the pioneers of transplantation and nephrology um, in Leeds and in Newcastle. I have to say Newcastle, I've been there, I have to say it properly, Newcastle. And then I came back to Cambridge to do a PhD, and then 15 years ago I was appointed as a consultant in Manchester. So I'm down here in London as, on a secondment, and as part of that secondment I've been doing work with patients and with colleagues on improving how we deliver um, educational, not just educational information, but learning what the patients and their families are concerned about, and then trying to see how we can improve how we interact and how we give them the opportunity to, inter to interact. I'm going to start, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to talk about. Hopefully I'll talk about it, and then I'll finish, hopefully, on time. So um, we're going to have a brief history, a little bit about transplantation, a little bit about the role free. I'm going to tell you why you might need a transplant. In, which, I mean, so in order to do that, I need to tell you what kidneys do and what happens when kidneys go wrong. I'll tell you something about the transplant service and how we go about working up a patient for a transplant. That's our technical term, a workup. How do we assess patients for transplantation? How do we get them ready to go on the waiting list or to have a live donor transplant? I'm going to describe what happens when people come in to have a transplant. And this central section is based on the pre-transplant education sessions we do to which patients and their families are invited. That central bit is, is a, 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 what the multidisciplinary team does to help prepare our patients for the options that they might have. And then the very big part of our work is post-transplant follow-up, because once you've had a transplant, we've got you for life. We have to follow you, we have to support you, we have to make sure you and your transplant last the very longest period possible, and that you have a very good life um, during that time. And finally, just a couple of slides about how good is the Royal Free. How do people who have transplants here, how does transplantation here compare locally and nationally? But just a couple of slides about that, because I don't want to do too much showing off. Okay, so I suspect most of you know the history of the Royal Free better than I do. It was founded in 1828 by a surgeon, William Marsden, who also went on to found the Marsden Hospital, which is the great cancer hospital. It took many years before people started understanding anything about kidney disease, but there was a vast progression of both understanding and managing acute kidney injury by the World War. So if they were good for anything, they were certainly good for developing innovations such as dialysis. William Kolf was um, a, 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 a Dutch man who was a, responsible for producing some very great innovations, not just in kidney disease, but in heart devices. He, he produced a lot of artificial devices. His artificial kidney, which was a rotating drum with sausage skin stretched over it, acted as a, as a very rough filter, and he managed to keep people alive. And this, he was a very um, noble person. He didn't patent his device. He sent um, samples out around the world, and the world nephrologists started using them and developing the services. And the Hammersmith Hospital in London uh, West London Hospital was one of the first places in the world to start using uh, Colf's machine. And people developed the machines further, but the Royal Free was not far behind. 
And in fact, it was the first planned service for people with kidney failure, the first planned service for transplantation and dialysis. And at the outset, dialysis developed as a way of trying to support transplant patients. So John Hopewell was a surgeon. Professor Sheila Sherlock was the world-famous eminent liver doctor who ran the department here. And between them, they planned to set up this unit, um, and the first patient started dialysis as we started the 1960s. And then, then the new unit was built. Um, there was a 10-bedded unit that was built that then uh, increased the number of patients that were involved. And John Hopewell also initiated the idea of home hemodialysis. So not only was he a pioneer in transplantation, but also he helped set up home hemodialysis. Other pioneers in the field who worked here were Sidney Sheldon and Roy Kahn. So Roy Kahn, here's the personal connection. Um, when I was a medical student, one of the very first firms I was attached to in Cambridge was the firm of Roy Kahn, who uh, went on to, not, to do liver transplants as well as kidney transplants. And many of you may have seen him over the years on the television evangelizing about transplants, but he did some of the earliest research that transformed transplantation. Before Roy Kahn's work on a drug which eventually got called azathioprine, if you transplanted even identically matched or very well matched people, the organs didn't last very long. But this drug, mercaptopurine and then azathioprine, allowed transplants um, not to be rejected. And so transplants lasted longer and longer by using steroids and other immunosuppression like azathioprine. <coughs> and the Royal Free was also very quick off the mark with live donor transplants. The day after the first live donor transplant in the UK, which was done in Edinburgh by Murray, the, the very day after, the 1st of November, so we're almost exactly an anniversary uh, there, a non-sibling transplant was done, a father to son. So that was also very important, the idea that you didn't have to be identical twins, you didn't have to be identically matched to get a kidney transplant. So why would you need a transplant? Let's think about the kidneys. Now, most of us have two kidneys, and the picture on the left shows you the two kidneys plumbed. Um, there's an artery, the, the, the blue represents the veins, and the red represents the arteries. The aorta uh, gives off the renal arteries, which then supply blood supply to the kidneys. And the kidneys are right up here at the back. Anyone remember the generation game with Bruce Forsyth? Do you remember that episode where they were asking you where all your organs were and how many people didn't know, A, that they had two kidneys and B, where they were? Because with P from down here, people tend to think the kidneys are lower down. But the kidneys, if they've migrated correctly during embryological development, are actually up here. During development, lots, the kidneys are very complicated. They're not like the liver. The liver's really simple. It's kind of one set of cells, really. But the kidney consists of several different types of cells. And in, in, in embryology, when you're developing as a fetus, the, the tissue is down in the pelvis, and then it has to migrate up to reach back here. And so during development, those tissues can get stuck in various places. So some of you may only have one kidney, or some of you may have a horseshoe kidney because the two kidneys didn't separate. Um, or you may have a remnant kidney. So congenital kidney problems um, can be explained by the way the kidney develops during embryological development. If we take a slice of the kidney, the outer bit is called the cortex, the inner bit is called the medulla, the filtering bits are called the glomeruli, and then we have tubules. You don't need to know much about that. I'm not going to do any physiology. In fact, I'm not going to do much science at all because I think what I want to get across is what happens to patients. But you need to know you have two kidneys. They need to work. And what do kidneys do? They are very clever. They filter. They filter all the... Effectively, they filter everything that's in the blood. They filter, they excrete, and they absorb. So especially in the tubules, there's a lot of activity going on. Some things need to be reabsorbed so you don't lose all of the stuff through your, in your urine. The kidneys excrete toxins and waste, so not just natural waste from the body, but anything you take in, almost all of it gets re is, is got rid of through the kidneys. Um, they deal with electrolyte balance. The most important electrolyte is potassium. Almost all of you know. Anyone heard of potassium? Potassium, if the potassium is not right, the potassium level goes up or the potassium level goes down, your muscles and nerves are not happy. And classically, in, in kidney problems, I'll explain what happens, but classically, that's the one that everybody knows about. You have to watch your potassium if you have a kidney problem. 
The kidney deals with acid-base balance in the body, and a lot of that is done in the tubules. It also deals with calcium and phosphate balance, not just filtering and absorbing, but through hormonal functions like activating vitamin D. And one of the other hormonal functions of the kidney is to produce erythropoietin. This is the stuff that once you could get it as an artificial substance, the cyclists injected. Lance Armstrong won all his, uh, many of his um, Tour de France, I don't know what the multiple is for Tour de France, um, using EPO. <laughs> using EPO to boost his haemoglobin. So when the kidney's not working, if you get kidney failure, what you get is a, usually a high potassium. You get uremia. That's the term we use for not just urea which accumulates, but the toxins which accumulate that are around the same size and which start causing an inflammatory process in the body. You get calcium and phosphate problems. Because you're not making EPO, you get anemia. You get fluid overload, you get hypertension, a whole lot of other things. So you can imagine that as the various parts of the kidney function, functions deteriorate, you can start to feel pretty unwell. But unfortunately, it can take a long time for you to realise what's wrong or for your doctors to realise what's wrong. We think of kidney injury in two different ways. We think of the acute kidney injury, which happens suddenly over a few weeks. And we hope that that will resolve. If we can pick it up and we can treat it, most people with acute kidney injury, we hope, will get back to their baseline. But in fact, at least 50% of them may not, and then they might get chronic kidney injury. So acute kidney is one cause of chronic kidney injury, chronic kidney disease. And if chronic kidney disease persists, we get what we call end-stage kidney disease, where your kidneys cannot keep you well anymore. If we left you in that state, your kidneys would not keep you alive. Just to talk for a minute about all the different conditions, many different conditions that could cause chronic kidney disease. So acute kidney injury, which is at the bottom, all those causes of acute kidney injury that we see day in, day out through casualty can cause chronic kidney disease. If you're diabetic, if you have hypertension, if you have vascular disease, around the world infections, if you have obstruction to the kidneys, if there's a, a blockage to the flow, there's back pressure. Then you have a small group of diseases, the kind that people like me who are immunologists really are interested in, a tiny group of people who will get inflammation, inflammatory diseases of the kidney, glomerulonephritis, diseases like lupus. A proportion of people get genetic diseases, not just the problems during development that we call congenital, but things like polycystic kidney disease and old pulse disease. And those people, actually one of the fantastic things about the Royal Free is we've got experts in all these diseases here to pick them up and help manage them. There's something called tubular interstitial nephritis, inflammation in the tubular area of the kidney, not the glomeruli, and that's becoming increasingly recognised as a cause of long-term kidney problems. So for glomerular doctors like me, we have to acknowledge that even with glomerular diseases, it's damage to the tubules that can cause the long-term problems. And if you want to know about acute kidney injury, Professor Salama did a, a Medicine for Members talk a few months ago, and that's available on YouTube. So David mentioned that if your kidneys aren't working, what, if you, you get kidney failure, end-stage kidney disease, what you might need is renal replacement therapy. And we use that term to describe um, both um, dialysis and transplantation. And I'm not going to talk much about dialysis except to say there are two types. And although transplantation has its positives, there are many, many people in the world living very good lives on hemodialysis. And one of the things about Manchester was one of my colleagues in Manchester, Peter Ackrill, had a great cohort of patients who he had looked after for up to 30 and 40 years. And by giving them long hours dialysis, he'd kept them well and working and out in the community for many, many, many years. So there are people who have dialysis who do very well. It's not the end of the world. But why would you prefer a transplant? Well, when we had our, we've had a number of forums now where we've asked patients and their carers, their families to come and talk to us. And universally, the universal term they use is, when I got my transplant, I got my freedom. I was free to have a, free, a diet that I chose to have. I could have what fluids I have. I can go and do all my activities. Um, I don't have to come to the hospital so frequently. And for women, it's extremely difficult if you have kidney disease, very, very difficult, 
not entirely impossible, but very difficult to have babies if you're on dialysis. If you have a transplant, we have lots and lots of women who've had transplants who've now had children. It changes the quality of your life. For some people, it prolongs the quality of life, uh, prolongs life. For most people, the biggest change is in the quality of life. Anyone who has a choice usually would prefer to have a transplant rather than, rather than be on dialysis. From, from a point of view of society and the NHS, in the longer term, it's cheaper. It costs us about £30,000 a year to pay for somebody to have dialysis. Although there's an initial outlay to have a transplant, it's much cheaper in the long term. Although, um, when, when the transplant community first tried to sell that idea to the Department of Health, somebody pointed out it would be cheaper not to treat anyone at all. That's politicians for you. So as you think about that little thought, um, we can broadly divide the kind of transplants that we do into two. One is a kidney obtained from a deceased donor and the other is a kidney obtained from a live donor. Deceased donor kidneys can come from somebody who's um, brain dead, but the heart is still working. Those are the people who might have had a head injury, they might have had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, they might have had a stroke. For the rest of the body, um, there might be other problems, but the heart is still pumping and the kidneys are okay. And in those situations where there is no hope of life, we would discuss with the relatives, the patient may already have their name on the kidney donor register, we would discuss with the family whether they would donate the organs. More recently, we've started to um, obtain organs for transplantation from people who've arrived in hospital with their heart not working, or they're in hospital and their heart stops working, and then there's a narrow window of time during which, if the relatives give permission, we can take their organs and, and use them for transplantation. This has really developed just in the last 10 years. If you have a live donor transplant, historically, we used to use patient, the donors who were closely related and for reasons that we'll come to in a little bit. But with the advances in immunosuppression, the drugs that we have, the treatments we can use, what we have found is more, much better to have a live donor that's not well matched than a cadaveric donor that is well matched. And that's all about how much time the kidney spends without an active blood flow. So, for example, if um, we get um, a kidney offered from somewhere, other, somewhere else in the country, um, the, from a deceased donor, the kidney has to be put on ice and travel however many hours, and it may take 15 or 16 hours before they, they, it's then transplanted. That's called cold ischemia time. For live donor transplant, usually it's adjacent theatres. <coughs> so the real advantage of the live donor kidney is it's fresh. If I can use that term, it's a fresh kidney. Um, and we can work the immunosuppression around the fact that you've got this really good kidney. Um, sometimes people buy kidneys. As a rule, we, we, it's not allowed in this country. We discourage people from doing it elsewhere uh, for all, all manner of reasons. Kidney team, the transplant team is massive. We have the whole hospital around us, but within the team, and it may be that I've still missed people off, we have surgeons, renal physicians, specialist nurses, tissue typing staff, the ward nurses, the theatre staff, including anaesthetists, donor coordinators, some places have recipient coordinators, and we have admin staff. And this would not work if all that was not gelling together. Everybody has a part to play, and that's why we hope that we treat everybody in our transplant service as part of our family, uh, because everybody counts. And the surgeon can't do their job if the administrator has not filled everything in properly. All right. So although the surgeons, bless them and I love them, and, and, and actually I'm very humbled by our surgeons because of the kind of work that they do, they get the glory, but it wouldn't work without a team, like many things in, in the hospital. We're very lucky here that we have a very good team. We, so in, in terms of numbers of surgeons in this hospital, our, we have, we've had four surgeons doing most of the work. So they're up every fourth night, effectively. They've just appointed a fifth, so hopefully that will get better, but the surgeons still work extremely hard. At the moment, in terms of physicians, we have nine physicians on the acute rotor and about 12 physicians who see patients in kidney. That's consultants. I'm using these terms to mean consultants. We've got teams of juniors. So one of the amazing things about the Royal Free is how much of the care is delivered, not just directed, but delivered by consultants. Patients get to see consultants almost every time they come to a clinic. 
So what does the transplant team do? Well, <coughs> the first thing is if somebody develops kidney failure is we have to assess them for a transplant and if they want a transplant, um, when they've listened to the information we have to give them, which actually is the talk that's usually badged, can I have a kidney transplant? If they want a kidney, we see them, um, our nurses see them, the surgeon sees them, physician sees them. We do a transplant workup, which I'll talk to you about a bit in a minute. Then they have to get on the waiting list if they don't have a live donor. Then there's the kidney donation, there's a transplant operation, and then there's lifelong follow-up. And in amongst all that, we have to educate and support our staff to make sure we're up to date with all the best treatments and any changes in the way we should do things. I have to educate and support the patients and their families. And as David said, this is one of the things I've been interested, not just locally, but nationally, because as transplant patients survive longer and longer, there are different issues that come out that I'd like us to be able to help them with. And also for them to be able to help themselves and their peers with. So it's not just about what the NHS can do, it's about getting the transplant patient groups to network to see what they can learn from how other people tackle various issues. So for transplant workup, the first thing is you have to be cardiovascularly fit. If your heart is not in shape, <coughs> you might not get through the operation. And before we started paying attention to this, in my lifetime, in my working lifetime in nephrology, people, we had a high death rate in the first year from heart attacks. Um, and then even in the first five years, people would die, have their transplant, perfectly fine kidney, they'd die of a heart attack. So we had to look to see what factors could we correct to make them fit for a transplant so that didn't happen. So cardiovascular fitness is very important. We have to make sure there's matching. We have to match the blood groups. We have to match the tissue typing. Everyone heard about tissue typing? We'll talk about this a little bit, but I'm not going to give you a great deal of deal. So essentially the tissue typing is uh, the, the badge on your, your cells that says you're you. And some, you know, your, your immune system has to recognise what's foreign and what's you. What's you. And, and differentiate. So we have to make sure if we put something from someone else into your body, whether someone else is a human or a mouse or a pig or whatever, that the body is not going to reject that. So matching is about avoiding rejection. And there are various things we need to look at, but the first thing is the blood group, the second thing is the tissue type. Although, with all the clever treatments we have now, we can sometimes push the barriers so that we um, cross-match, we, we transplant across blood groups, for example. We can't give you a transplant and give you lots of immunosuppression to dampen your immune system if you have an ongoing major infection or a cancer. Because if we do that, you would die of those things before whether the transplant works or not. So we look for various infections, particularly viral infections, and we look to make sure you've not got an obvious cancer. Um, there are one or two cancers if they're very small, or for example, if a prostate cancer is very mild, we might go ahead and transplant you because we think on balance, the benefits of a transplant will outweigh the risks. And finally, having a transplant is a big deal. You might just sitting there thinking, oh, I'm going to have a bit of somebody else in my body, and how's it going to do, and I might get off dialysis, but I don't want to take all those drugs. There are lots of psychological factors, and in live donor transplantation as well. So we have to check that you're robust enough. And if you're not, we, have, we try and help. Um, and sometimes, as a doctor or as, or as nurses in clinic, we're not best equipped to assess that. So that's one of the reasons uh, now many units, not all, you're very lucky here at the Royal Free, not all units have a psychologist or a counsellor, but the Royal Free has, um, has a team. Okay, so cardiovascular fitness. Now, the middle slides, all the jolly ones, were done by my friend Peter Dupont, so uh, just thought it would liven things up. So uh, make sure your heart's beating, that's the starting point. Check your, do a chest x-ray to make sure there's nothing, nothing showing the heart failure, like fluid or enlarged heart. You get an ECG, that's a pretty nice normal ECG. We might send, if the ECG is not normal or when we examine you, we hear a murmur or something else, we might send you for an echocardiogram. That will also help us judge how much how good your pump is. is. When you pump, when your heart squeezes, is it pumping out enough blood? Because if it's not doing that, A, you might not get through the operation, B, you might be pretty poorly afterwards. And finally, if we've got any concerns about your fitness, 
uh, we might send you off for a stress test. Now, this is a, an old picture showing somebody on a, on a treadmill, um, but we can, there are clever ways of doing stress tests which involve nuclear medicine tests, and our extremely clever cardiologists can also do something called a stress echo, where they look at your heart directly after giving you something to stress the heart, and then they can tell us whether your heart is going to bear up under um, this kind of scrutiny. And if it can't, there is a multidisciplinary team meeting between renal and cardiology to decide, is there a way of improving your cardiac function? For example, some patients might need a, 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 an angiogram and a stent. Some people might need a bypass graft. These days, it's pretty rare for us to turn people down on the grounds of their heart not being fit enough, but uh, there are a few people who don't pass muster. But it's really important to get that right. Okay, that's the, that's the next thing we have to look at, obesity, partly because of cardiovascular fitness, but partly just because the survival of patients who are very obese is not as good. Although, in fact, not as bad as we thought, but we usually want people to lose weight to get to a certain BMI. I'm not going to give you a number, because as the surgeons and anaesthetists improve, develop skills over time, they've allowed larger and larger patients to be the beneficiaries of transplantation. Occasionally, we do send people off for bariatric surgery. It is possible to get you to lose weight through bariatric surgery where you have uh, some kind of uh, stomach operation and then have a transplant. And those patients actually don't do too badly once, if they've got through all that. Okay, so the matching test. The matching tests, the blood grouping tests are done by the blood transfusion service, which is a separate laboratory uh, from our tissue typing laboratory. And again, at the Royal Free, you have this extraordinary... Um, world resource, which is the Anthony Nolan Lab, which houses the tissue typing um, laboratory. And we get fantastically expert um, opinions, testing and opinions, because it's not always black and white. They will, they will tissue type the recipient, the kidney patient. They might have to tissue type many, many pa people who come forward as potential donors. They have to tell us... Um, what the different types are and whether and they can calculate the risks of, of um, reaction between the two different kinds of tissue type that they're given and there are lots of data from the nhsbt national blood transfusion and, and transplantation service that help us work out if you have this tissue type what is your chance of having um, a transplant in the next five years as well as doing the tissue type the lab also looks for antibodies. So antibodies are demons. Antibodies are bad. Unfortunately, garlic doesn't work against them, but um, we have to know what antibodies are in your system. Antibodies are produced by the body to react against invading organisms. So if they start reacting against bits of you or bits of a transplant that get put in, that's not good. Antibodies can destroy the thing they're attacking. So just a couple of words about tissue typing. HLA stands for human leukocyte antigen. Now, anyone who wants to go and read about tissue typing will find themselves stuck in the world of MHC, major histocompatibility complex, because when people first started studying immunology and transplant, it was in mice and in rats. So the HLA is the human equivalent of the MHC, if you start reading. And what we have to know is there are class one and class two, and we have to match all those six that are listed down below. So the HLA complex sits on chromosome six. The laboratory has to look to find what variant of each of these you have, what kind of class A, class B, class C, and what kind of class DP, DQ, DR do you have? And then it has to look for antibodies against them, um, to, antibodies against your potential donor. So it's a, a lot of work and a lot of analysis. And then they look for antibodies. What antibodies do, as I've said, is they attack um, the cells that are carrying the antigen. The antigen is the thing the antibody recognises. And if there, if there are antibodies in your system against the antigens on your donor, bad luck for the kidney. Very bad luck for the kidney. OK, so all the funny slides are by Peter. I, I'm not good at jokes, really. So I've mentioned this, with the Royal Free Psychological Services, in, in the real department we've got th at the moment three um, psychologists, we've got two very senior people and we have a rotating person who's a bit more junior, um, and they will see patients individually, they'll see patients, families, and they'll support patients on dialysis and pre and post transplant. 
So, David, one of the positives that's coming out of us increasing the frequency of our education sessions is the psychologists are seeing people who say, oh, yes, I know about that, and I know about that, and I understand about that. So already, although it's just six months since we revamped that service, we're seeing people coming through having a better understanding of the kind of issues that they'd face. And just, just one more, so this isn't about people with psychiatric illnesses. It's really important for us to get across to patients and their families. We don't think you're bonkers. We don't think you're mad. We don't think you're mental. We just know that you have issues and concerns that in our clinic, we're so busy doing all the stuff about the physical things and giving you information about the future, we don't have time to explore how you feel and what worries you. And that's what our psychology colleagues are much, much better at. Actually, I should just... So, in terms of the live donation, the things that we have to be concerned about, um, it's important for us to be aware of. We have a whole team that works on live donation. We have specialist nurses and the doctors and the tissue typing people. Is that there isn't any coercion. You can imagine in a family, depending on the pressures, you might... I once got called by a, a colleague of mine who was a professor of um, nephrology in Bristol about a family that he was looking after where there was a youngest daughter who wasn't yet married... And everybody thought that she should donate a kidney to dad because that was the best way of sorting out dad, who was now 78. And it was hard because, because most of the family didn't speak English for Peter to get to the bottom of that. And was there any coercion? Now, in the end, there was, it, was clear, it became clear there was quite a lot of coercion. So we had to support the family to, to move away from that and find another solution. So it's one of the things that we're very concerned about. And also, that's why... We, we, uh, we don't support anyone buying kidneys or selling kidneys. Okay, so the waiting list. So the waiting list is a difficult um, thing to explain to people because on the one hand, I'm going to show you the next slide and then come back to this one. It is a waiting list, but it's also a lottery. You go on the waiting list and you wait, but it's a lottery because you can't have a kidney till your match comes up. Until you've got a donor that you won't react against, you can't have the kidneys. So there's an element of waiting list and lottery. Once you've had all your tests and your physician um, decides you're fit enough, you can go on the waiting list. And people get very upset because they think the minute they're on dialysis, they can just go on the waiting list. But they've got to have their work up. And because there are risks with a transplant, not everybody gets to go on the list. There might be lots of things that might stop you. But we're keen to get people transplanted. They're all free. There's, um, there's continual pressures to look at how can we make this process quicker and smoother, how can we speed up our processes, how can we get tests done faster, how can we make the decisions quicker, because we know that's better for patients. But the, and the waiting time counts, because if there are two patients offered the same kidney, so say it's like your number's coming, I have two of you get the, the numbers for the, for, the, for, the, for the 20 million or whatever. I don't do lotteries, so I have no idea how much you win. But if two people come out as identical on the tissue typing, on the matching, the time waited will be one of the factors that we look at. The person that's waited longer on dialysis will, um, would probably get the kidney. So that's what the national waiting list numbers looks like. Now, on the left-hand side is the number of transplants done um, in total. Across the bottom is the year. And the, the straight line is the number of transplants, um, the number of people on the waiting list. So you can see that a few years ago, we were really very, very worried because the waiting list looked like it was rising and rising. And um, so there was a concerted effort by the uh, kidney community and the Department of Health and the patient groups, uh, the Kidney Alliance, to promote transplantation and to get more and more donors. And, and to some extent, we've succeeded, but the waiting list may also have dropped off for various other reasons, and, and we're not quite sure about that. So overall, the number of donors hasn't increased that much, but we're, year on year, we're doing more transplants. And the other factor is we're doing more transplants that last longer. Because of the treatments we're giving, because of the drugs that we're using, the transplants are lasting longer. Because a significant proportion of people who need a transplant are people whose first transplant has failed. So if we can make transplants last longer, that's one of the ways in which we can level off the waiting list. So waiting list and lottery, if, you're not, if you haven't got a live donor, you're waiting. So how long might you wait? Well, if you have a live donor, we aim to get your transplant done. Once the workup is done, we aim to get it done within three months. Every week, there's a meeting, and um, Peter Dupont and the surgeon sit and look to see, to plan week on week, the transplants and what's holding them up. 
So you could get that done within three months if you've got a donor that's, that's suitable. If you have a deceased donor, the average wait is three years. Average wait is three years. But if you have rare blood groups, which happens in some um, ethnic minorities in particular, um, you might have to wait much longer. These are average waiting times. So you can see that for many people, there's a significant wait, waiting time um, once you've got on the list. Now, the thing I didn't say is it is possible to get on a list before you actually start dialysis. And we promote the idea of preemptive transplantation. Getting a transplant before you start dialysis puts you in the best group for survival and outcomes. All kidneys are not equal. So I talked to you a little bit about the non-heart beating and the heart beating. There is a difference. If you get a heart beating deceased donor, the ones that we, that we used to call the brain, uh, brain, brain death donors, that's a better kidney than a non-heart beating donor. To do with the length of time the kidney blood supply uh, isn't available. But the live donor's kidney is the best. So we're always promoting live donation, but remembering that it's not possible for everybody. And uh, more than half of our patients still have to wait for a deceased donor kidney. The benefits of the live donor kidney are you have a shorter waiting time, so you don't have to have dialysis. It's easier to get a preemptive transplant. If you have a live donor, we try and get it done before you get on dialysis. It's more likely to work straight away. Most live donor kidneys would expect to be working the next day. And then you're in for a hospital for a very short time. You have a relatively straightforward course. It often provides you with better kidney function because we've chosen a really healthy kidney from a really healthy donor. You get this fresh, healthy kidney and you're off to a flying start. And overall, they last longer. So the average survival for a really good deceased donor kidney, the average survival will be 12 years, which for a live donor, the average survival is 14 years. But many, many live donor transplants have uh, last many, many, many years longer. Okay, so again, this is Peter deciding that people needed a break in speed of um, discussion. So what do people who want to be kidney donors ask us? So did you recognize the picture? Anyone recognize the picture? Slumdog millionaire um, facing the questions. And um, he, we've got some questions for the audience here. So if you're a kidney donor, if you want to be a live kidney donor, which of the following is true? You have to be over 18. Put your hands up if you think it's right. Less than 60 years old, a close relative or a spouse, or paid no more than £5,000? <laughs> so the answer is all, you have to just be over 18 years of age. We have had donors um, as old as 70 plus, and you don't have to be close relatives. A friend can donate. And we have around the country, astonishingly, amazingly, in the last year we've had a hundred people walk off the street and offer a kidney. Altruistic donors. No benefit specifically to themselves. They've seen some, uh, something on the television or they've heard a story and altruistic donors are now coming forward. Okay? So you just have to be over 18 years of age. What is the risk if you offer a kidney? So donating a kidney carries the same risk of death as playing football for a year. Is that a death rate in football? You wouldn't imagine that, would you? One in two and a half thousand. Driving a car for a year, certainly you see it on the North Circular. Cycling to work or school for a year, or skydiving for a week. I don't know that. I don't know how many skydives you do in a week. It's actually the same, about the same as driving a car for a year. So that's a slightly sobering thought, okay? Slightly sobering thought, there is a risk. After donating a kidney, a life expectancy is reduced by five years, reduced by two years, unaffected, or greater than for the general population. It's actually greater than for the general population because by the time you get to be a live donor, we have given you the MOT of your life. All right? If there was anything wrong with you, whether you wanted to know it or not, we'll have found out. And so if you... Can I now go around and ask, uh, get people to sign up to be live donors? Right? <laughs> <laughs> you've got a we don't know, who, who, David, you <laughs> can't do that until we know how many kidneys everybody has. Uh, you, you don't know how many people in the room are, um, are, have already been donors or how many have, not got, have got kidney failure. So actually, 
if you come forward as a donor, you get a free medical. So guys, think about it. Okay, risk of kidney failure, if you donate a kidney, what's the risk to you? Well, just before I say that, remember, if you're living with somebody with kidney failure, it ruins your life as well. Everything that, that your partner, child, spouse, cousin is affected by can affect you. It can affect your daily, what you eat in the house, where you can go, what holidays you have, what work you can do, your income. Everything affects you. So one of the benefits of giving a kidney is that both your lives are transformed. Both your lives are transformed. The person who gets the kidney's life is transformed. But for most carers, what we find is that their lives are also vastly improved. Okay? But what is the risk of kidney failure in later life? Well, 50% more than for the general population, 10% unchanged. It's less. It's less than for the general population. Again, because I've explained we wouldn't let you do it unless we think you'd be able to cope. Do we always get it right? No because we, we're not stargazers. Um, and um, occasionally, it may not work that way, but none of us can see into the future. To the best of our abilities, we make, make sure you're not put at any excessive risk. Um, and actually, just before... So I will say, it's, it's, none of our surgeons are in the room, but I have the greatest admiration for our surgeons, because they have to do something every day that is so against the grain. They have to cut people up. And when surgeons are learning, it's a really big hurdle to start cutting people up, to harm them to do good. Okay? It's one thing to cut somebody up to give them a kidney. It's a really big thing to cut a healthy person to take out a kidney. It's a really big thing. So the fact that we have people, amazing people, who have got the training and are prepared to do that, is, is I think it's amazing. I think that's, that's you know... We can't give them awards, but it's, it's a really big thing. And we should, for all that I was teasing earlier about that they get the glory, they should get the glory. They are doing the most difficult thing of the lot. Because I've done enough kind of procedures where there were minor risks to patients to know how much stress there is. Every time they do a live donor, they worry about it. It's not done casually. Okay, so people get very desperate. If all else fails, we, there are actually kidneys occasionally on eBay. We don't let you have a kidney. We don't get you, unless if we find out. Somebody's just recently advertised in the, in the London Columbia newsletter for a kidney. We're trying to work out whether that was legitimate. Um, possibly if no money exchanged hands, but, you know, this is not a good thing. And we discourage people from going abroad to buy kidneys because uh, in my experience in Manchester, I had half a dozen people who'd gone to the Middle East and... Uh, the Indian subcontinent, who'd come back having acquired not just a kidney, but hepatitis B and C. And you get your, hepatitis, your free virus with the kidney, they tell you the donor's healthy, but you get your virus, we immunosuppress you, you die of liver failure. It's, it happens. And so on the whole, we're very, very against that. If you've got a potential donor abroad, your donor can come here and we'll uh, help, to help with that and, and do your transplant here. Okay, so advances in transplantation mean that some of those hurdles that we had in the past, like incompatible blood groups and uh, antibodies in your system that stop you having a transplant that was going to work, that would cause immediate rejection, can now be overcome. And we do things like put you on plasma exchange to clean out your blood, give you drugs that, that destroy the cells that are producing the antibodies both before and after the transplant. So people who are desperate for transplants who have been waiting for a long time, we might do these selective transplants. And the centre which started most of this, uh, well, there's a lot of them done in Japan, because in Japan all the transplants are done are from live donors. They've learned to overcome barriers. But they all used to be done in Coventry. The Royal Free is now on the centres where, if absolutely necessary, we would do these treatments. However, they're difficult treatments and they still carry a risk. So the other set of um, arrangements that have been set up is what's called a paired exchange scheme. So say Mrs. A wants to donate a kidney to Mr. B, Mr. A, and Mrs. B wants to donate a kidney to Mr. B, but they're not compatible. But Mrs. A's kidney is compatible with Mr. B and, and vice versa. They, we arrange that they could swap kidneys. All right? And in fact... The really clever people, much, much cleverer than I am, have set up chains where you could have six or eight or ten people donating so that, so that ten people get a transplant, but not, you don't get the transplant from the, your immediate relative or whatever. 
They're called, it's called a chain of transplantation. You could start a chain, for example, with a deceased donor, or you could start a chain with an altruistic donor who donates the kidney, and then it goes down the chain. I think the longest chain in the States has been 100. But this all started in, in the Netherlands, where, they, where there are small countries that they could set up to look to see what the matching was around the country. This is fantastic. This is real altruistic behavior. It's one thing to give a kidney to your, the person that you love. Another, kidney, another thing to give a kidney to somebody else for the exchange. I think it's a really big mental barrier that people have done well to overcome. But we also, um, if people are not compatible, we, we ask them to consider going into the paired exchange scheme. So this is all available through our services here. Okay, so you haven't got a live donor, you're on the waiting list, you're waiting, and you carry your pager, you have to tell us when you're going on holiday, or don't go on holiday, um, but at some point the pager goes and you think, oh my god, what am I going to do? Um, you know, what do I do when I get the call? So the first thing is, stop eating and drinking, because at some point in the next 12 hours we hope you're going to get a transplant, which means you're going to need an anaesthetic, so you, don't need, you must not eat or drink anything, or the anaesthetist will be very unhappy. The next thing is you need to get here. Peter just likes sports cars, although I don't know what that car is. He would really like a Porsche, the newest Porsche that there is. Get here quick, drive safely. We want you in one piece. We, we don't want your, the person driving you to have to donate their kidneys to someone else. Very black humour. Um, get here quick, get here safely. And when you get to the hospital, if you thought the wait on the waiting list was long, that wait, when you arrive in hospital, while they're deciding if you're going to get that kidney, that's the longest wait of all for the patients and their relatives. So you've been told on paper there's a match. They want you to come to the hospital. You have blood tests done. They assess you are fit when we put you on the list. Are you still fit? Are you fit for an anaesthetic today? The dialysis patients might need a session on dialysis to make them fit for the anaesthetic. We need to do another cross-match test. We take cells from the recipient and mix them with cells from the donor to make one final check that they're not going to bust up. Make sure there's no antibodies that are going to destroy uh, the new kidney as soon as it goes in. We might start giving you some treatment ahead of the transplant to dampen your immune system. So we might give you some drugs before you go down to theatre. And then you're off to theatre. So that's just about the cross-match. Confusing, lots of medical things are confusing. For reasons that are lost in time, a negative cross-match indicates it's safe to proceed. A negative cross-match means the, um, the recipient's blood didn't bust up the donor's cells. So, it, so it's really confusing for patients. They say, we say your cross-match was negative, and they start crying. But actually, that's a good thing. Negative cross-match is a good thing. So historically, all the surgeons had to be good artists. I think this is a drawing that Roy Kahn actually did of um, what it looked like once he'd plumbed a transplant kidney in. But this diagram might show you a little bit better. The kidney goes usually down in the iliac fossa, uh, down here, in the, in the inguinal fossa down here. So it's tucked away a little behind your hip bone. Can you, can you see? Tucked away behind your hip bone. And extra peritoneally, so it sits outside the lining of the gut outside the lining of the abdomen. That's really useful because if we need to biopsy your kidney, that means we don't have to go inside the lining of the gut. Um, it doesn't have a nerve supply, but it needs a blood supply, an arterial supply, and then it needs to be able to drain the blood off, and then the ureter is connected down to the bladder. So, you get your kidney, you go up to the ward, and then and you were waiting for the urine to come out. If you've got a live donor kidney, the urine starts coming straight away as soon as the kidney's plumbed in. But sometimes, like David, you find the kidney's not working. So, what we say is don't panic, because most of these kidneys will start working in due course. As a pedant, I'm a pedant. I'm a Cambridge girl, I'm a pedant. I went to a Yorkshire grammar school and I went to Cambridge, I'm a pedant. I'd say this is primary, not, if the kidney doesn't work straight away, it's actually a primary non-function. So only once it starts working that we can say this was delayed graft function. But we all use the shorthand for delay because we make the assumption it's going to work. So why might you have a slow start? You might have had a long cold ischemia time. You might have had a non-heart beating donor. You might have toxic drug levels. So we monitor your drugs that we're giving you um, regularly. We monitor the blood levels. There could be surgical issues. There could be blood clots or 
in spite of all the tests that we've done, there could be rejection. So the transplant ward is a really intensive place. There are people there all the time. There are ward rounds twice a day. There are blood tests at least once a day. And here you have a consultant ward round every day. Not every unit does, but most units on the transplant ward, you go around every day. You don't leave it to your registrar. You don't leave it to the house officer. This is serious business. If the kidney stops working or doesn't work as well as we think it should, we have to move now. When I was a registrar in Newcastle, I, uh, the year I was there, we did 137 kidney transplants. And my job was to make sure that everything got done. So I used to get a turnaround in three hours. In three hours, I could tell you whether the patient needed a biopsy. They weren't obstructed. They, didn't, they, they had a blood supply. There wasn't an infection. So we would go ahead and do a biopsy. Sometimes in some places, it takes a bit longer. We, as soon as we find out, the sooner we can correct it. So assuming we correct all that and you get out of hospital, um, we're then going to have to keep watch for whether transplants are working or not. So most transplants work, all right? At the end of the year, most transplants are still working. But why do transplants fail? Well, early on, it's to do with tr problems with the surgery, or rarely it's to do with rejection or infection. But in the first year, for live donors, there'll be a 5% failure rate, and for ca cadaveric deceased donors, there'll be a 10% failure rate. That means either they don't get to work at all, or they start to work and then something else happens. All right? And then later on, beyond the first year, you, the most common thing is what we call transplant glomerulopathy. That just means transplant's going wrong for a multiple of reasons. Rejection, ischemic problems, infections, recurrence of the original disease. Patients might stop taking their tablets or might not take as many as they ought to. Now you think, well, bloody daft beggars, I'd, I'd take my tablets. But you just stop and think how many times you've finished your whole course of antibiotics. Just stop and think for a minute. And most of us miss the odd... Oh, if you're taking blood pressure tablets, the odd day, you know, you've gone out shopping, you realise halfway around Sainsbury's you forgot to take your tablet that morning. Patients are human. Sometimes they miss tablets. But some people hate the tablets so much, the side effects are so horrible, they can't bear to take them. Some people listen to... Other people in the waiting room who say, don't always take my tablets, and I'm okay. So patients might, and the, the really key group that we worry about is the teenagers. If they've had a transplant when they're younger. The classic time is adolescence and going to university. When they're at home and being monitored by mum and dad and they're having pills forced down them, they're fine. And then the minute they're, they're away, they want their independence, they want to be like their mates. We know, there's lots of research done, that we know there can be up to a 20% failure rate at that point. So those are points at which we need to put in um, greater vigilance or, or support the patients in a different way, like having young patient groups. So how can we help you keep your transplant? How can you help keep your transplant working? Please take your immunosuppressive drugs and everybody should take their drugs for life. There is a secret in that a small number of patients probably could stop their drugs. They become tolerant. Very hard to work out who they are. And so until we find the markers for tolerance, you should take your drugs for life. You might not need as many later on because the immune system does adapt to some extent. For the first few months, we also make you take prophylactic antibiotics. The immune system is heavily suppressed at the beginning. We don't want you to die of nasty infections. Come to clinic. It's like it has to become like a religion. Everything else has to take second place. Right, including your Chelsea football match. Uh, so you have to come to clinics. Mm, they'll have kicked off. I'm in trouble. Um, but I'm in trouble. Um, attend clinics religiously. What helps you keep your transplant longer? Cardiovascular fitness. As a nephrologist, it really kills me to say it, both in kidney clinics and transplant clinics. The heart that matters. If your heart and your cardiovascular system is not fit, you don't keep yourself fit with exercise and watching your weight and controlling your blood pressure, the kidney's not going to do well. And you're not going to do well. Avoid contact sports. You know, rugby's out, boxing's out. Actually, football probably should be out. You can, although um, um, there, is a, a, there is a rugby player who had his kidney put inside his abdomen to allow him to carry on playing rugby rather than at the front here because he was a professional sportsman and he did get back to playing rugby for a number of years. Tell us if you're planning to get pregnant or, or, or if you get pregnant, come and tell us because there are certain drugs we shouldn't have you on and we need to monitor you and your kidney through the pregnancy. <coughs> but we have lots of patients having successful outcomes. 
And at the bottom, I've put, use sunblock and don't smoke. So I am your mother. I am the nag that will tell you that all the time, especially the gentlemen, or even the non-gentlemen, just the men. Um, wear hats outside, wear sunblock, because the biggest, uh, the commonest cancer in transplant patients is skin cancer. And um, the drugs that we use increase the risk of the skin cancer. Don't smoke. Smoking causes worsening cardiovascular function, can cause strokes and heart attacks and all the rest. But every time you smoke, I tell you to people, imagine that artery constricting with every cigarette. Okay? And you smell horrible and you get cancer. Okay. So in the transplant clinic, you've got, for example, um, Dr. Harbour did a clinic yesterday, which was quite a quiet clinic. There were only 16 patients and I was helping. But quite often, the doctors have to see about 20 patients in three hours. And what they've got to do is monitor the kidney function, monitor the drug levels, work to reduce the cardiovascular risk, identify any infections, and early detection and treatment of malignancy. So we can't do that on our own. And the Royal Free has this great, um, fantastic transplant nurses, specialist nurses, who help us do it. So this is called surveillance, so monitoring and surveillance. And this is lifelong. To begin with, you'll need to come very frequently, weekly, or even twice weekly, and then, as time goes on, we hope to get you out to four monthly or six monthly clinics, if all is well, okay? And we need to support you because although for many, many patients, life with a transplant is fantastic, it's not exactly normal. You know, you've got to take the drugs, you've got to come to clinic. If you've been on dialysis for X years and you've not worked, three months after you have your transplant, the letter will arrive on the door, your benefits are stopped because you've got a transplant. You then have to prove to the authorities what disabilities and needs you have before they'll give you your benefits. So money can be a problem. What we're trying to do now is find ways of supporting um, patients and their families in this period because there's no point in having a good transplant if your life is a misery. So we, we hope that by groups like the Kidney Patients Association and by linking in with social services, by getting patients to network, those kind of things are also put in place we'd really like to have a properly integrated service across social services and healthcare. Okay, so that tells you as much as I think I'm gonna tell you today about transplantation, but what are your chances of successful transplantation and how well do we do, how well do we perform at the Royal Free? We've got a few problems, which I'm gonna give you up front because actually the Royal Free population, the people that we look after, the patients that we look after comes of a population that is very ethnically diverse. And there's a high rate of sensitization. That means many of our patients already have antibodies in their blood. Lots of reasons for that. Blood transfusions, it can be a reaction to pregnancy. They may have had other transplants before. They are difficult to match. It's difficult to get organs for them. So in some other units, they would struggle. But what I'll show you is that once you get on the list that they're all free, you've actually got a pretty good chance of getting a transplant. So this graph shows um, the, how, how, risky, how risky it is um, uh, on the x-axis and the units along the bottom. You can see that uh, even for the riskier grafts, even for the high-risk donors, we're doing very well. We're at the at left-hand side of, the, of that slope. And if we look at how well the transplants do for the living donor transplants, compared with other London units and the UK, the one-year survival of the Royal Free is 98%, the five-year survival is 93%. So we're not, so for the, for the one-year survival, we're doing very well. We're not quite there with the five-year survival, but probably, statistically, that's not very different. Okay, so there are ways in which we might be able to do a little bit better. There's another way of showing this. So if you look at the straight line that goes across the middle, think of that as the average. Think of that as the average uh, national rate. And then the dots are the different units. The red dot is they're all free. And the green dot is 100%. So what is the survival at five years if we adjust for the risks of the patient? So considering how high risk our patients are, I think we're doing pretty well because we're performing above average. And the two blue dots are other London units. So not much, I don't think there's much benefit in you choosing another unit. What about cadaveric transplantation? And again, you can see the red dot, the raw free, is lying well above that curve. Okay, so we do pretty well 
compared with the number of transplants that we're doing, allowing for the number of transplants that we're doing, we're doing pretty well. And again, this looks at the uh, risk, the donor risk index. So how the kind of donors that we use, if we, there are ways of predicting would that be a good kidney or a bad kidney, we're actually using high-risk kidneys. So in spite of using high-risk kidneys, kidneys that might not be perfect, we're performing pretty well. So, as David said at the beginning, I could have done all this in two minutes. We could have all gone to the pub. You could have watched his football match from the beginning. Can you have a kidney transplant that you're all free? Yes. And you'll do well. But at the end of that, the thing that we will need to do is support you forever. And what we want you to do, if you've had a kidney transplant, is come back and tell us how it was. Share your experiences, partly because we think it will help you, but partly we cannot improve, we cannot develop our services unless we know how it was for you. And I, and I think that's so... David has helped, David and the KPA have helped me set up this set of forums, which is called, How Was It For You? You know, how was it coming to the Royal Free, being prepared for the transplant, having the transplant, and whatever's happened afterwards? And can you think of ways in which we can improve it? And when people come to do this, I think human nature, if people give you something, they want something back, we're using that opportunity to put in some educational um, input. So one of the things I have learned over the last decade, people, we think we're telling people everything they need to know about transplants and drugs, but every patient still feels they want to know more about those things. Every patient who comes to our meetings, there's a whole cohort that doesn't come. But people can't know about, enough about the drugs. And then we can tell them about new drugs that are coming online. Because I think patients ought to be able to have an equal dialogue with their caregivers. It's your life, it's your kidney, it's your well-being. We ought to be able to arm you with enough information that you can have what feels like a more equal conversation. Because usually when you go into a clinic, the doctor, the doctor, here the doctors may not be on the other side of the desk, but there's a formality. They're on the higher chair. They're usually wearing their stethoscope. They've got five minutes. You can feel that they're rushed. If we bring people to a, a non-clinical environment where there's less of a pressure of time and people have the time to discuss things, we find people open up and they can ask the questions they've been burning to ask in clinic but we didn't want to bother the doctor. So I'm the person who gets phoned by all her friends' parents, even the ones who are doctors, because they didn't want to bother their doctor, but they know I'll talk to them. All right? So we've all been there. You've got one more question you want to ask, but you can see the doctor's busy. I'll tell you a story about that in just a minute. Because this is my friend Judith. So I'm going to finish on a personal note. This is my friend Judith on the right. We met at Addenbrooke's in 1983 as we started our clinical medical course. And we used to go on Saturday mornings. Saturday mornings? Can you imagine the students coming here on Saturday morning now? For the, for the professorial ward round that Roy Kahn used to do up on the transplant ward. So that's where Judith and I met in 1983. You can work out how old we are. She's older. Um, so Judith's son, John, uh, Joe, who's my godson, was born with kidney failure. When they were scanning Judith, doing the ultrasounds during pregnancy, they saw he had dysplastic kidneys but then decided it was okay, and when he was born, they let him go home. Nine days later, Joe had to be rushed into hospital with acute kidney failure. His cracking was 300 plus, which for a baby is enormous. His potassium was 7.4, which is life-threatening. His, uh, his bicarbonate was 10, he's acidotic. And he had a blocked system. His bladder wasn't draining, his kidneys hadn't, and it, that had caused a back pressure on the kidneys. His kidneys were dysplastic, they had not developed normally. And so he had to have, have a catheter and surgery to relieve the pressure on the bladder. And so from the age of a few days, Joe has been on treatment of one sort or another. When he was discharged from hospital, he was on 17 different kinds of tablets that Judith had to give him every day. The baby. So Joe did quite well. His acute kidney injury resolved, but he was left with chronic kidney disease. He was looked after in a specialist paediatric unit not in Cambridge, but elsewhere. Cambridge and Oxford, Cambridge and Oxford don't have paediatric nephrology. They don't have paediatric. You have to go somewhere else. So Joe was looked after elsewhere, and when he was eight, he then needed a transplant. Um, and unfortunately, his father came forward, but unfortunately, we found that uh, Tony had a dysplastic kidney. He only had one working kidney. He had that kidney taken out. He couldn't give a kidney to Joe. At that time, there were three other children, so Judith wasn't, couldn't really step up as a live donor at the time. 
But Joe got a cadaveric transplant, which lasted him quite well for a number of years, until he was about 14. And then, for uh, various reasons, he got severe acute rejection, and that transplant failed. So you're 14, you get, you, you've had a transplant, you thought you were doing okay, the transplant fails. You end up on dialysis. His, his dialysis unit was two hours' drive from where he lived, because there's no paediatric service in Cambridge. So I had to stage it. I don't... I was going to say I don't often do this. I occasionally need to stage an intervention. I stage an intervention on behalf of my uh, friend because not least, if you have a kid who's missing three full days at school, three full days at school, not only is their schooling affected, all their social life is affected. You know, how, and how do you explain to your friends where you are and why you're missing so much? So I staged an intervention and got Cambridge, who only have an adult unit, to take him on to dialyse him because he, he was 15. And they set him up to be able to go from school and dialyse on the twilight shift. And then because he dialysed well, he was very fit, and Judith turned out to be a good match, she then donated a kidney. So three years ago next week, Judith, who's the best mum in the world, you see that from her mug, donated Joe a kidney. And Joe's fine. The only thing he was interested in is had we brought a dongle for his laptop <laughs> so he could get on the internet. And um, last week, Joe submitted his, he, did his, he didn't miss his GCSEs. I'm so proud of him. Didn't miss his GSEs. GCSEs. He's got good grades. He's done well at AS. He's going to be an aeronautical engineer. Isn't that fantastic? But he's going to go to university and not be able to do exactly what his friends do. He can't go and drink like an idiot during Freshers' Week and all the rest of it. He won't. He's, he's very sensible. I hope he won't. So... I've come to you talk to you initially as a professional, but actually this touches us all. We've all got people that we know that this kind of thing happens to. So I know it from a professional side, but actually I know from a, from a personal side. Um, Joe, is now, Joe is now 18. So we've had this in our family, as it were, for 18 years. I'm the kind of surrogate aunt, really. Um, and so it's really good to see the transplant patients doing really well. But our concern is the transplant won't last forever, so he may need another one further on. So apart from anything else, I'm going to come back to this slide. I would like to think you all to think about being on the donor register and considering being donors. Because even if we can't use your kidneys, there are other bits of you that might be usable. So think very hard about that and get yourselves signed up to the donor register. So I'm going to finish by thanking everybody here at the Royal Free for hosting me here and making me so welcome, especially the Kidney um, Patients Association and David Myers and Nee Plange and the whole group. My colleagues, uh, particularly Peter Dupont and um, um, Alan Salama, who have lent me all these slides. Joyce Grant is one of our tissue typists, who's also done a lot of work to be able to present information at the education evenings, and I've used a couple of her slides. Gareth Jones is the lead for transplantation. Joe Henry is one of our nurses. So I've pinched slides from all of them. I've done very few from scratch. The history I got from um, this website, which is um, worldwideweb.renhist.co.uk. And finally, I'd like us just all to pause just for 30 seconds, just to think about the people who donate kidneys. Because when we had the forum, when we had a national forum for transplant patients and their carers, the one thing that came out more strongly than we'd expected was how much time our patients, our recipients spend thinking about their donors. And if they've had a deceased donor kidney, thinking about the people who allowed their loved one's kidneys to be donated. So I don't want you to clap, I just want you to pause for 30 seconds and just think about that. Okay, now you can go to the pub. <laughs> Thank you.